The Babylonians and Assyrians maintained scrupulous records concerning all aspects of their lives. Because these records were written on clay tablets in a dry environment, archaeologists have found hundreds of thousands of these tablets scattered across hundreds of ancient sites. The Babylonians had an intricate system of dating that involved naming each year after a prominent event in the preceding year, a system that has given historians a great deal of precision regarding the relative dating of events in Mesopotamian history. However, there are two main problems that remain. The 3,000-year period of recorded Mesopotamian history contains significant gaps, or dark ages, during which there are no records available. This leaves Mesopotamian history with large chunks of tightly understood periods of time that are separated from one another by gaps of unknown lengths of time. The solution historians have devised is to anchor specific events within one of those chunks of time that allows the rest of the chronology, at least for that given chunk, to fall into place. One such anchor for Mesopotamian history comes from the recording of astronomical events. Since modern astronomers have carefully measured these events and the intervals at which they occur, historians take the ancient descriptions of astronomical events and pair them with modern backdated calculations of Julian calendar dates, when such events would have occurred. Using one famous text called the Venus Tablet that describes the first and last visibilities of Venus over the span of a 21-year period, Dated with the first names of Ami Sedukwa, Hammurabi's great-great-great-grandson, historians in the past 75 years or so have posited three competing chronologies, named High, Middle, and Low, dating the beginning of Hammurabi's reign to 1848, 1792, and 1728 B.C. respectively. For years, historians have argued the merits of one chronology over the other based on pottery typologies, and which system provides for the best fit. In the meantime, historians have agreed to use the middle chronology to prevent endless confusion in the secondary scholarly literature. More recently, the astronomical data has been refined and examined with multiple astronomical events from other Babylonian sources brought into the picture. Combining the Venus cycle and eclipse data produces a new date from the beginning of Hammurabi's reign of 1696 B.C. But in lieu of reprinting thousands of historical textbooks containing the likely incorrect middle chronology, it is the middle chronology that remains the status quo. Though he is often referred to as the first king of the Babylonian Empire, Hammurabi was the sixth ruler in the first dynasty of Babylon, a dynasty that was ethnically Amorite. Amorites had been living in southern Mesopotamia for around 200 years before Hammurabi's great-great-great-grandfather, Sumu Abum, took the throne, and they had assimilated neatly into the cultural milieu in southern Mesopotamia in the early 2nd millennium B.C. Hammurabi's father, Sin Mubalit, was even given an Akkadian name by his parents. Mesopotamian kings wrote very little about their family relations, and, as of yet, there are no records naming Hammurabi's mother. What is clear is that she and Sin Mubalet gave Hammurabi a traditional Amorite name. Mesopotamian names were typically short sentences that often had some relationship to the birth process, and more often than not, the name contained a divine element, naming one of the many Mesopotamian deities along with a second element. The second element could thank the deity for the new child thank the deity for saving the mother during the ordeal of childbirth, or in some cases, lament the mother's death. The first element of Hammurabi's name is the Amorite word Amu, paternal uncle. The first sound in his name, represented by the character, did not exist in Akkadian, so Akkadian speakers tried to approximate that sound with either an H, as in the case of Hammurabi's name, or with no character at all in other instances. There is slightly more debate about the second element of his name. The Akkadian scribes clearly interpreted it as an Akkadian word rob, meaning great, thus interpreting the final I as a case ending that was common in Akkadian and in personal names. Since this word also appears in Amorite, this interpretation makes sense, 
and produces a meaning, the paternal uncle, the deity is great. But the sounds of B and P were often confused in Akkadian, and the cuneiform writing rarely distinguishes between the two. Amorite has a root RP that would fit this name either as a participle, rapi, healer, or as a past tense verb, rapi, he has healed. In this case, this final sound did not exist in Akkadian and would be absent from the Akkadian writing. Both words would make sense as a sentence name with either the paternal uncle, the deity, is a healer, or the paternal uncle, the deity, has healed the child's mother. The alternate spelling of Hammurabi's name, Hammurabi, reflects this latter interpretation. Unfortunately, there are no records of what palace life was like for a young prince growing up in the palace of Babylon, nor is there information of the age of Hammurabi when his father died and he took control of the kingdom. Although not as charismatic as his son, Sin Mubalit left Hammurabi a stable kingdom from which he would eventually build an empire. One of the sources of stability for this kingdom in Babylon came from a relationship that Hammurabi's father and grandfather had built with their neighbor to the north. During the reign of Apel Sin, Hammurabi's grandfather, Samsi Adad, ruled from the northern city, Ekelatum, from whence he was driven in 1818 B.C. by Naram Sin, ruler of Esnuna. When the latter conquered Ekelatum, Apel Sin and his son, Sin Mubalit, Hammurabi's father, provided asylum for Samsi Adad in Babylon, where he stayed for the entirety of his exile. The Amorite kings of this first dynasty of Babylon may have felt some kinship with Samsi Adad, based on their shared cultural heritage. After Narim Sin died, Samsi Adad returned to Ekelatum, refortifying his position as king, and in 1808 he conquered Assur. During the reign of Hammurabi's father, Sin Mubalit, and during the first fifteen years of his own reign, Samsi Adad, was the most prestigious ruler in the region. Moving his own capital to Sabat in Lil, Samsi Adad continued to reign over this region for the next thirty-three years, installing his eldest son as ruler in his old capital, Akalatum, and his youngest son, Marai, in the newly conquered western region of the empire. It was likely this kindness paid by Hammurabi's father and grandfather to Samsi Adad that created a type of alliance between the two Amorite-ruled empires that Hammurabi inherited. Although there was no formal signed treaty between the two kingdoms, like those that existed between other rulers around this time period, the treatment of the city Rapakum is instructive regarding the relationship between Hammurabi and Samsi Adad. The city had remained in the hands of the territory of Esnuna and the heirs of Naram Sin, who had driven Samsi Adad into exile. To hear Hammurabi's historians, scribes, describe it, the eleventh year of Hammurabi was forever to be known as the year in which he conquered the city of Rapakum. But when Hammurabi himself describes the attack years later, he gives a much more diplomatic description. Samsi Adad forced Rapakum out of the king of Asnuna's control and gave it to me. While it might be tempting to view this statement as a simply rhetorical nod to Samsi Adad, the fact that he mentions that both he and Samsi Adad held garrisons there jointly, and that he uses the case of Rapakum as a model by which he and Zimri Lim might treat a city hotly contested between them, indicates that their collaboration was more than just fanciful memories. Hammurabi inherited not only alliances, but also enemies from his father. Rim Sin of Larsa ruled southern Mesopotamia during the reigns of Sin Mubalit and Hammurabi, and Sin Mubalit felt sufficiently threatened by Rim Sin to join a coalition with Isin and Uruk against Rim Sin. One letter from the ruler of Uruk to Sin Mubalit emphasized the close nature of their relationship. God knows that since we have come to know each other, I have trusted in you as one would trust in Ishtar, and my head has rested on your very own lap. 
Rim Sin responded to the formation of this coalition with a defeat of their armies in 1808 BC. And just eight years later, Rim Sin destroyed Uruk and its auxiliary troops. Recognizing the losses that his allies had sustained, Sin Mubalit fortified his position by conquering Isin, the city of his former ally, and taking it out of the reach of Rim Sin. Rim Sin of Larsa bided his time until Sin Mubalit's last year on the throne, possibly when he was the weakest, if not physically, then militarily, at which point Rim Sin took control of Isin for Larsa and himself. For Rim Sin, this conquest of Isin was the crowning moment of his reign, since he continues to name every subsequent year, for thirty-one years, after this monumental defeat. But Hammurabi refused to let this situation stand, and in 1785 BCE he wrested control of Isin and Uruk back from Rim Sin. It would be another twenty-two years before Hammurabi would finally defeat Rim Sin entirely and conquer Larsa, but Rim Sin certainly did not seem to accomplish much in his last twenty-two years of rule, if his year names are any indication. Unlike the numerous royal inscriptions and monuments left by Hammurabi, archaeologists have not found such monuments commemorating Hammurabi's father, Sin Mubalit. From his year names, it is clear that Sin Mubalit named both a canal and a wall after himself. But Hammurabi may have felt these monuments were insufficient to honor the name of his father. Hammurabi therefore built a fortress that he named Dur Sin Mubalit Abim Walidia, the wall of Sin Mubalit, the father who bore me. Cases of Mesopotamian kings naming building projects, such as this one after their father, are rare indeed, and may point to the measure of love and respect that Hammurabi held for his father. Hammurabi also had a sister, Iltani, whom he may have grown up with. When Iltani came of age, Sin Mubalit appointed her to serve in the temple of Samas in Saipar as a Nadaitum. Several sources suggest that such Nadaitum were dedicated to the deity in a type of betrothal ceremony that included a wedding gift, dowry, for the girl and her father. One can speculate that Iltani was likely Hammurabi's older sister, based on rough calculations of how long Hammurabi would have lived were they the same age. It is also interesting in this connection that the longest law that appears in the Code of Hammurabi, Law 178, is one that deals with the dowry of a Nadaitum, whose father has died. The first law on the list, 178, which is also the longest, describes the case when a father has recorded a dowry in the form of a field or orchard for his Nadaitum daughter in a tablet. But the wording of the contract does not give her authority to give her estate to whomever she pleases. In such a case, her brothers are to take the field or orchard and manage it, providing their sister with as much food, oil, and clothing as is in accordance with her inheritance share. If her brothers fail in this duty, she may then reclaim the field or orchard and rent it out to a tenant that would provide her with these necessities but she is prohibited from selling the property, since it also belongs to her brothers. The next law, 179, addresses the question of what happens if the proper authority is given to her in the dowry contract. The following two laws, 180 through 81, address the question of this situation when there is no dowry. This legal text provides insight into the social obligations Hammurabi, as her brother, would have been expected to provide Iltani. He would have been responsible for his sister and for her well-being. One expression of that care for his sister appears in the fourth year of his reign, when Hammurabi reinforced the enclosure of the Gagum at Saipar where she lived. Hammurabi at least marketed himself as a pious worshipper of the Mesopotamian gods of his time. One of his epithets in his law code was one who venerates the gods. Some gods were given more airtime than others, but Hammurabi talks freely of the major deities of the pantheon and many of the minor deities as well. He describes himself as created by the moon god Sin, 
and the Amorite grain god Dagon, as the ally of Samas the sun god, as brother of the god Zababa, the god of Kish, companion of the plague god Ura, beloved of Ishtar. Hammurabi believed that he was preordained to rule Babylon, and that the gods called him by name. The formative mythological event to which he equated his preordination was the exaltation of Marduk over the other gods described in Enuma Elis. This focus on Marduk is understandable since Marduk was the god of Babylon. There is an inscription commemorating his construction of the temple Ezida in Borsippa for Marduk. And Marduk was also important to Hammurabi for military reasons. Like other Mesopotamian kings, before embarking upon major military campaigns, Hammurabi would consult Marduk, along with Samas the sun god, about his plans. One example of this appears in his description of his actions before attacking his long-term enemy, Rim Sin. I have complained to Samas and Marduk, and they have responded with a yes. I did not attack without the approval of the god. When they went into battle, his army would carry emblems of these gods, representing their presence with the army. And the twenty-seventh year of his reign, just before he began his program of empire building, commemorates the construction of the main emblem of reddish gold, which is carried in front of the army, for the great gods his helpers. Just as Babylon was important to Hammurabi, so was justice. And Samas was the god of justice. It should be remembered that Samas was the deity to whom his sister was dedicated in Sippar. Hammurabi also referenced the god Samas when he named one of his sons, Samsu Iluna, Samsu being the Amorite form of the name Samas. In the Code of Hammurabi, he gives the following blessing of Samas upon the future ruler who does not deface Hammurabi's image. I am Hammurabi, king of justice, to whom the god Samas has granted insight into the truth. My pronouncements are choice, and my achievements are unrivaled. They are meaningless only to the fool, but to the wise they are praiseworthy. If that man, a future ruler, heeds my pronouncements, which I have inscribed upon my stella, and does not reject my judgments, change my pronouncements, or alter my engraved image, then may the god Samas lengthen his reign, just as he has done for me. Perhaps more insightful into the role Samas played for kings like Hammurabi appears in the corresponding course that Hammurabi pronounces. But, should that man not heed my pronouncements, may the god Samas, the great judge of heaven and earth, who provides just ways for all living creatures, the Lord my trust, overturn his kingship. May he not render his judgments, may he confuse his path and undermine the morale of his army. When divination is performed for him, may he provide an inauspicious omen portending the uprooting of the foundations of his kingship and the obliteration of his land. May the malevolent word of the god Samas swiftly overtake him. Additionally, it is Samas who is the deity seated upon the throne before whom Hammurabi stands in the scene depicted on the top of the steel that bears the code of Hammurabi. Part of honoring these deities included not only invoking them in children's names and blessing and curses, but also building temples for them. Two of Hammurabi's many epithets in the law code mention his work on the temple of Samas, calling him the one who has made famous the temple of Ibabar, which is akin to the abode of heaven and the one who renews the Ibabar temple for the god Samas, his ally. There is also an inscription commemorating the construction of this temple, which was in Larsa. It is clear, however, that the king's concern for the temples was not completely altruistic in nature. For most of the cities in southern Mesopotamia, the temple served as the economic center of the city. The temples organized the local labor and collected the local taxes, and were then passed on to the state level. Building or renovating these temples served to boost the local economy, and thus the state taxes from these temples that went into the palace. This is evident from one of Hammurabi's letters regarding this temple in Larsa, which reads, 
Speak to Sinadinam as follows. Thus says Hammurabi, As soon as you read this letter, report to all accountants in your province and to Warad Samas, son of Iribam, the herdsman of the temple of Samas, that they should come to you with their accounts. Send them to Babylon so that they can make their accounts here. They should travel day and night so they arrive in Babylon in two days. This is not to say that Hammurabi was only concerned with his own bottom line. In the following letter, it is evident that the palace was already paid, but Hammurabi is still concerned that the temple has been shortchanged. Speak to Sin Edinam as follows, thus says Hammurabi. Sib Sin, the scribe of the merchants, reported to me, and you by Marduk laid hands on the money for the temple by Ilkitim, which is due from the city of Dur Gurguri and from the region round about the Tigris. And he has not rendered the full sum. And Gamil Marduk has laid hands on the money for the temple of Bit Ilkitim, which is due from the city of Rahabu, and from the region round about that city. And he has not paid the full amount. But the palace has exacted the full sum from me. In this manner he reported to me. Why? Another deity that was clearly important to Hammurabi was the Amorite grain god Dagon. The previous chapter discussed the close personal and political ties between Samsi Adad and Hammurabi, but there may be another connection between these two rulers as well. Hammurabi was most likely a child when Samsi Adad was taking asylum in the palace of Babylon, and it may be more than mere coincidence that Hammurabi chose Dagon to be his personal god, the same personal god as his mentor and ally Samsi Adad. Mesopotamian worshippers not only venerated the major deities in their pantheon, but each individual chose a personal god who would intercede for them with the major deities. Kings were no exception. Hammurabi also venerated female deities, as goddesses were an integral part of the Mesopotamian pantheon. Probably no goddess was more prominent than Inanna, also known as Istar. In the fourteenth year of his reign, Hammurabi constructed a throne that was finished with gold, silver, semi-precious stones, and lapis lazuli, like a blaze of light for Inanna of Babylon. He also built a temple for Inanna in Zabalim, after he conquered Larsa, where an inscription found there states, after the goddess Inanna gave him a positive omen to govern the land of summer, and Akkad, and placed its reins in his hands. Hammurabi built the Zykalama temple, her cherished house for his beloved Inanna of Zabalim, the city for which she is the mistress. Following the war with Elam described below in Hammurabi as conqueror, the priestess of Istar in the region of Imut Belum, where the war took place, were displaced. Hammurabi had them brought to Babylon possibly to serve at the Inanna Istar temple there. A letter regarding this situation explains. Speak to Sin Adinam as follows. Thus says Hammurabi. Behold, I am now dispatching Zakir Elisu to you, the Ababdu, and the messenger Hammurabi Banai, that they may bring hither the Istaraitu women of the country of Imut Belum, Put the Istaraitu women aboard barges so they can come to Babylon, and the Kazritu women should accompany them. Provide sheep for the food of the Istaraitu women, and take on board enough provisions for the maintenance of the Kazritu women on the journey until they reach Babylon. Assign men to tow the boat, and a guard of elite troops so they can bring the Istaraitu women safely to Babylon. Let them not delay, but speedily reach Babylon. It would be hard to name all the deities for whom Hammurabi built temples or whom he praised in various inscriptions because that list is extensive. The Mesopotamian deities and their temples were of great importance to the lives of the people whom Hammurabi ruled, and he both recognized that fact and capitalized on it. One of the king's central roles in ancient Mesopotamia was to provide for his people and Hammurabi touted that quality in one of his epithets in his law code, which calls him he who heaps high abundance and plenty. In the harsh climate of Mesopotamia, 
He accomplished this by ensuring his people had access to water. Through the process of digging new canals or clearing old ones, the king made certain that his people could water their crops adequately, feed themselves, and pay their taxes. This specific means of providing abundance is highlighted in his epithet, one who provides abundant waters for its Uruk's people. Hammurabi took an active role in delegating specific directions to his subordinates regarding such digging projects. One such letter reads as follows. Speak to Sinadinam as follows. Thus says Hammurabi, The canal which has been cleared out has not been cleared out as far as the city of Uru, and therefore boats cannot enter the city. Moreover, which is on the bank of the canal of the city of Duru is possible. This work is not too great for the men that are at your disposal the third day. When, therefore, you see this tablet, clear out the canal within the city of Uruk with the company of men at your disposal. After you have cleared out the canal, do the work concerning which I have written you. In addition to digging canals, the king could organize work projects to reclaim unsuitable land for farming or have storage silos constructed for storing grain. Hammurabi did both of these things for the city of Dilbat, according to another set of his epithets in the Code of Hammurabi. There is also an inscription commemorating the building of a granary in Babylon. When the inhabitants felt the palace was not providing for them, they did not remain silent. A letter from Larsa expresses one farmer's complaint to Hammurabi's governor. I am not getting water from Sin Adinam for my sesame field. The sesame will die. Don't tell me later. You did not write to me. The sesame is visibly dying. Ibila Brat saw it. That sesame will die and I have warned you. From that sternly worded letter, it would seem that the role of the king as provider was one that the general populace expected. But Hammurabi clearly did not appreciate being told directly that providing for people was an obligation. In his palace, a dispute broke out over those who were and were not provided with a special robe for a palace meal. The servants from Yom Kahad received robes, while only the dignitaries from Marai, not their servants, received similar robes. And one terse question received a strong rebuke from the king. The Marai official pulled Hammurabi's minister of foreign affairs aside and asked, Why do you separate us, as if we were sons of pigs? Whose servants and secretaries are we? We are all servants of a king of the first rank. Hammurabi responded, are you in charge to decide about garments in my palace? I dress whomever I like, and I don't dress whomever I dislike. There are many indications that being a just ruler, or at least being perceived as one, was important to Hammurabi. One of his first acts as king following his coronation was to proclaim a Mysarum that involved a cancellation of debts throughout his kingdom. Not only did he make this decree, he publicized it by highlighting this as the most prominent act of the second year of his reign, ensuring that it was mentioned in the date formula of every official document written in that year. This practice, though not without precedent, had not been common prior to the reign of Hammurabi. The last Mysarum, recorded in the text now available, was issued by Samula L., Hammurabi's great-great-grandfather. Not only did Hammurabi declare a Mysarum in Babylon, but when he finally ousted Rim Sin of Larsa from power, he declared a Mysarum throughout the newly expanded empire as well, helping to secure his popularity with the local population in Larsa. Even when he attacked Larsa, the concept of what today one would refer to as a just war was part of his marching orders. He instructed his commanders, if the city opens its gates when you arrive, accept its surrender. Even if the city disdains the oath of Samas and Marduk, do not harm it. He sought integrity on the part of his military leaders, even if his enemy did not share such a commitment. A much more famous example of Hammurabi's commitment to justice appears in his law code. The twenty-second year of his reign was forever known as the year of the statue of Hammurabi as King of Justice. This identification of the steel bearing the code of Hammurabi with the statue mentioned in this year name 
is made secure by a self-referential statement in the Code of Hammurabi itself. This statement in the epilogue reads, I have inscribed my precious pronouncements upon my stela, and set it up before the statue of me, the King of Justice, in the city of Babylon. Nevertheless, it is also clear that this law code was updated at different times in his reign, and the law code now extant dates from no earlier than the 38th year of his reign. In the prologue of this law code, after describing himself with as many favorable epithets as came to his mind, Hammurabi clearly placed the impetus for his justice on the shoulders of the god of Babylon, Marduk, saying, when the god Marduk commanded me to provide just ways for the people of the land, I established truth and justice as the declaration of the land. Although Hammurabi's law code is the most famous of the Mesopotamian law codes, it was not the first. The tradition of law codes being written and published by Mesopotamian kings had been well established in the Sumerian tradition, and Hammurabi simply carried that tradition over to the Akkadian language. The first attested Sumerian law code now extant is that of Ur-Nama, king of Ur, and dates from around 2100 BC. Slightly closer in time and geography to Hammurabi was the law code of Lipit-Istar, or Isin, circa 1930 BC. These Sumerian law codes are similar to that of Hammurabi's in both form and content. All three codes begin with a prologue that gives divine sanction to the king of his authority to impose righteous rule over the kingdom. Not only are these prologues similar in form and style, a comparison of the prologue of Lipit Istar's law code with that of Hammurabi's is striking. The law code of Lipit Istar begins as follows. When great god An, father of the gods, and the god Enlil, king of the lands, the lord who determines destinies, gave favorable reign and the kingship of the lands. Compare this with the first few lines of Hammurabi's law code. When the august god Anu, king of the Anunnaki deities, and the god Enlil, lord of heaven and earth, who determines the destinies of the land, allotted supreme power over all the peoples. After the prologues, these law codes continue with the individual laws. The first law in the Code of Hammurabi reads, If a man accuses another man and charges him with homicide, but cannot bring proof against him, his accuser shall be killed. Law 17 in the Laws of Lipit Istar says, If a man without grounds accuses another man of a matter which he has no knowledge, and that man does not prove it, he shall bear the penalty of the matter for which he made the accusation. After the set of laws, the formal similarities continue, with each closing with an epilogue that reads like an oath before the various deities that they have acted justly in their governance of the people, followed by a set of curses for anyone who would deface this legal inscription. Keeping in mind that in both cases these are English translations of two different languages, it is nonetheless exceedingly clear that Hammurabi is dependent upon this prior Sumerian tradition. This prior legal tradition not only provided models for Hammurabi in the form of the content of his law code, but in the very purpose behind the law code itself. One of the primary goals of establishing law and justice in the society was the protection of the weak and powerless. This protective purpose appears in the prologue to the laws of Ur-Nama, where he says, I did not deliver the orphan to the rich. I did not deliver the widow to the mighty. I did not deliver the man with but one shekel to the man with one mina, i.e. sixty shekel. I did not deliver the man with but one sheep to the man with one ox. Hammurabi describes his similar purpose in this way. In order that the mighty not wrong the weak, to provide just ways for the waif and the widow, I have inscribed my precious pronouncements upon my stela. It is clear from Hammurabi's communication with his subordinates that this concern for the oppressed was not mere rhetoric for him. In Larsa, after a group of workers refused to perform either additional work or different work from that which they were originally assigned, Hammurabi wrote a letter to his governor of Larsa 
sin idinum, forbidding his governor from forcing these workers to do the newly assigned task. Speak to sin idinum as follows. Thus says Hammurabi, do not put to forced labor the watchmen who have refused to do the additional work for you. They will do the work that was originally assigned to them, and then you will remove them from the of the overseer who is in charge of them. While it's only fair to acknowledge the rich legal tradition Hammurabi inherited from the region, Hammurabi's code is no less historic. Whether it was an actual innovation or whether he simply articulated the case more clearly. Hammurabi described an attempt at legal transparency that is unparalleled in the earlier law codes. In this way, the code of Hammurabi was not simply a document that the scribes kept on the shelves of their library and consulted when a case came to trial. It was a central guide for the life of Hammurabi's empire. Let any wronged man who has a lawsuit come before the statue of me, the king of justice, and let him have my inscribed stela read aloud to him. Thus may he hear my precious pronouncements, and let my stela reveal the lawsuit for him. May he examine his case, may he calm his troubled heart. In this way the poor and the oppressed of the land could be assured that the scribes and legal authorities were not simply changing the laws as they saw fit. The public and seemingly permanent nature of the steel was one way to reinforce this sense of transparency. Hammurabi also strove for this type of transparency with his appointed officials as well. One letter from Hammurabi reads as follows. Speak to Sinodinum as follows. Thus says Hammurabi. Among the officials of the palace gate, who were under the control of Erisa, there are certain men who are cumbered with pledges, and Erisa is going unto you. Examine their affairs and return their pledges to them, in order that they might not be involved with litigation. The palace gate was the traditional place where local judges sat and oversaw dispute. Hammurabi had learned that some of these judges had debts and could make them susceptible to bribes, thus compromising their integrity. Hammurabi, therefore, asked his governor, Sin Adinam, to cancel their debts in order to maintain their integrity. This concern about the possibility of bribery was not merely hypothetical. Below is one case that came to Hammurabi's attention. Suman la Ilam told me this. A case of bribery occurred in Bad Tibaira. There are men who took bribes and witnesses who know about it. That is what he told me. I am sending you Suman la Ilam with a mounted messenger and a soldier. As soon as you read the tablet, investigate the matter. If there was indeed bribery, put a seal on the silver, and all that was taken as bribes and send it to me.'